after surviving more than six assassination attempts and having been reported dead at least 17 times, Jonal Savimbi was shot dead by soldiers of the Angolan Armed Forces, assisted by Israeli surveillance expert on the 22nd of February 2002. Jonal Savimbi, who was described by many as one of the most charismatic African rebel leaders, spent over 35 years in the bush fighting first for the Angolan independence and later against the Angolan government led by the MPLA. The assassination of Jonal Savimbi marks the end of the 27-year-long Angolan civil war in which more than half a million people were killed. The civil war, which was initiated at the height of the Cold War, set the stage for a prosy fight between the United States of America and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic USSR. But who is Jonal Savimbi and how did he maintain the struggle for this long? In this edition of this program, we look at the life story of Jonal Savimbi, the charismatic but notorious rebel leader of UNITA. Please come with me, Gabriel here. Don't forget to leave a like on this video and subscribe to his pool media if you enjoy the content. Thank you. The man known to history as Jonas Mahiro Savimbi, the founder and president of the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola, UNITA, was born in Mohango City in Moziko province of Eastern Angola on the 3rd of August 1934. He was the son of Lotte Mahiro Savimbi, who was an important Ovimbundu chief and worked as a station master on the Benguela Railroad and a prominent Protestant layman, and his mother was Helena Mbundu Savimbi. His ethnic group comprises about one-third of the nation's population. At the time when Juna Savimbi was growing up in Portugal, Angola, it was very difficult for blacks to acquire much education in the country. Fortunately, Savimbi attracted the friendship of Portuguese missionaries who helped him to enter an all-white high school. He graduated first in his class in 1958 and earned a scholarship to study medicine in Portugal. Savimbi spent two years in college in Lisbon, but his passionate views on his country's plight sparked a change in career plans. He became an activist on behalf of Angolan independence and soon had to flee Portugal for Switzerland due to police harassment. There, he studied at the University of Freiburg and the University of Lausanne promoting himself as a potential leader for a free Angola. He made the fateful decision to leave the study of medicine because he considered the freeing of Angola from the yoke of Portugal colonialism his country's most important priority. This motivated Jonas Savimbi to transfer to the University of Lausanne to study political science and law and graduated with honors in 1965. In February 1961, the young student interrupted his studies to take the position of Secretary General of the Union of the People of Angola, also known as the UPA. He then negotiated a major with the Angolan Democratic Party, which resulted in the creation of the National Front for the Liberation of Angola, the FNLA. The FNLA would become the leading organization opposing the Portuguese fascist regime in the country. This step was taken with the active encouragement of Kenyan nationalist Tom Mboya and Jomo Kenyatta, who would later become the first president of an independent Kenya. This was the birth of Savimbi's organized political activities, which lasted for more than 35 years. The struggle has three main phases, the ending of Portuguese colonialism, the removal of the one-party regime imposed by the Russo-Cuban Occupation Army and the establishment of a multi-party democracy of national reconciliation. On March 15, 1965, the FNLA and the MPLA based in neighboring countries began a guerrilla campaign against the Portuguese rule on several fronts. This was followed closely on the heels of an attack on the Sao Paulo prison in Luanda on February 4 in a failed attempt to free nationalist political prisoners. During this period, Jonas Savimbi played an important role rallying diplomatic support for the anti-colonial uprising, particularly in the African state. By 1964, the anti-colonial war had been undermined by a division between the FNLA and the MPLA. This division deepened because Savimbi wanted to start a fight from within Angola rather than from beyond its borders. In 1965, Jonas Savimbi decided to form his own movement and seek support for it. 
The much needed support came from the People's Republic of China as the young patriot arranged for himself and his lieutenant to receive training in guerrilla warfare in the East Asian country. While in Peking, Savimbi met Mao Zedong and other leaders of the Chinese Revolution. On his return to Angola, however, Savimbi still pursued unity with the FNLA and the MPLA, using Zambia's first president, Kenneth Kaunda, as an intermediary. But both sides rejected the unity overtures. It was now time for Savimbi to put his ideas into practice. As alluded to earlier, Jonas Savimbi was originally affiliated with Holden Roberto's National Liberation Front of Angola, the FNLA. On March 13, 1966, UNITA was formed following a period of intense political mobilization in the village of Mungai in Mozico province of Angola. Nine months later, on December 25th of the same year, UNITA launched its first attack on Portuguese authorities. Within the next eight years, UNITA carved out a liberated area in eastern Angola where it established primary schools, agricultural cooperatives and clinics and kept military pressure on the Portuguese colonial army. On the 10th of November 1975, Portugal formally renounced its control of Angola. But a quick and bitter power struggle ensued and the popular movement for the liberation of Angola, the MPLE, the Marxist Leninist Workers' Party, declared itself the new government and was led by Agostino Neto. When Savimbi and his UNITA party protested, the MPLA invited Cuban troops and used Soviet manufactured weapons to maintain power. Soon after, Savimbi was on the run. He was pushed into the bush country with only a few dozen followers to his side. But Savimbi was not to be easily beaten. Within a short time, he attracted and conscripted a new army. His message was simple and direct, pointing out to his followers that Angola had only traded domination by the Portuguese for domination by the Soviet Union. His argument found fertile ground in Angola and elsewhere, especially in South Africa, where the minority-run white government feared Soviet incursion into the continent. With the help of South African weapons, soldiers and training, Savimbi was able to organize a powerful and effective guerrilla force. Time after time, the Angolan government with its Cuban reinforcement and Soviet war machinery tried to annihilate Savimbi's army, but this proved particularly difficult and impossible. By the mid-1980s, Savimbi's UNITA forces were now holding vast stretches of territory from which they harassed government installations, railroads, and supply lines. Savimbi's next mission was to lobby the United States for aid and he did that many times. In 1986, the United States Conservatives convinced President Ronald Reagan to meet with Savimbi at the White House. While the meeting itself was confidential, Reagan emerged from the meeting with support and enthusiasm for Savimbi's effort, stating that he would envision a UNITA's victory that electrifies the world. Under Savimbi's leadership, UNITA proved to be an effective force before and after independence becoming one of the world's most effective armed resistance movements of the late 20th century. Jonas Savimbi came to be described as Africa's most enduring bushfighter given the number of assassination attempts that he survived. At first, Savimbi seemed to be running a campaign aimed at winning the support of his Angolan countrymen. But by 1985, suggestions of human rights abuses by UNITA forces began to surface. Without question, however, the ruling MPLA had committed numerous violations of human rights, torturing and killing suspected UNITA supporters without the benefit of trial. In the same vein, thorough investigation in the spring of 1989 revealed that UNITA has been committing systematic abuses of human rights. It was reported that UNITA forces had laid landmines in fields to deter peasants from planting their crops and had in some cases deliberately attacked and killed civilians. The report suggests that UNITA's objective was to intimidate civilians into supporting it or to punish them for assisting government forces. By the end of 1989, Angola's economy was shattered and about 200,000 of its citizens had been killed. 
many citizens faced severe food shortages and the fighting slowed international relief effort. By 1990, most of the Cuban troops had left Angola and the Soviet Union's own domestic problems made further assistance to the Angolan government difficult. At that point, the United States stepped up its assistance to UNITA and Savimbi shifted its base of operation from Angola's southern reaches to its north where US military supplies could easily be received across the border. Through the summer of 1991, Savimbi's forces harassed the capital city of Luanda, cutting power lines and intercepting supplies. Eventually, the MPLA was forced to admit that its policies had indeed contributed to Angola's shattering 20 billion debt and its almost total lack of productivity. On May 31, 1991, the Angolan president, Jose Eduardo dos Santos and Savimbi, signed the Biases Accord. The accord provided for the end of the one-party state and the holding of multi-party elections on September 29 to 38, 1992. In the aftermath, peace now reigned in Angola. But shortly after the election in 1992, crisis returned in the oil and diamond-rich nation as the presidential election was declared inconclusive and reaped with fraud and irregularities. Nevertheless, on October 17, Savimbi informed the United Nations that UNITA was accepting the result in the interest of peace. A high-ranking UNITA delegation led by the party's vice president, Jeremy Chitunda, was sent to Luanda to negotiate the modalities for the presidential runoff. While they were there in Luanda, coordinated attacks were launched against UNITA in Huambo on October 31 as an agreement was concluded and ready to be signed. The attack spread to Luanda, where UNITA's vice president, Chitunda, and other officials were killed in the Halloween massacre. But despite this attack, negotiations and diplomatic efforts continued with UNITA. But it was when government forces launched further attacks during the week of January 2 to 9, 1993, on UNITA in urban areas, that the country was plunged back into war. In late 1992, Following the general elections, the United States government for the first time recognized the legitimacy of the MPLA and stopped their support for UNITA. Moreover, Savimbi's decision to forego the runoff election further strained UNITA's relations with the United States President George W. Bush. After fair talks in 1993, another agreement to the Lusaka Protocol was implemented in 1994 to form a government of national unity. But UNITA broke away from the Lusaka Agreement in 1998, citing its violations by the MPLA. Between the late 1998 and 2000, UNITA began to suffer implosion from within as most of its leaders and commanders ended their allegiance to the organization. After surviving more than six assassination attempts and having been reported dead at least 17 times, Jonas Savimbi was shot dead by soldiers of the Angolan Armed Forces, assisted by Israeli surveillance expert on the 22nd of February 2002. The soldiers had tracked him down in the remote woodlands of Moziko province where he was hiding. The firefight resulted in several gunshot wounds to his head, his throat, upper body and his legs. While Savimbi returned fire, his wounds proved fatal and he died almost immediately. He was hurriedly buried in Luena Men Cemetery in Moziko province. Six weeks after Savimbi's death, a ceasefire between UNITA and the MPLA was signed, but Angola remains politically divided between the MPLA and UNITA supporters as the MPLA continued to consolidate its hold on power in the country. 17 years after his death, in June 2019, his body was assumed and given a dignified burial in a funeral ceremony in his home village of Lopitango. He was survived by several wives and dozens of children, numbering at least 25. For more on the story of how President Laurent Desiree Kabila of the DRC was assassinated by his own child soldier, please click the video here. And remember to leave a like on this video and subscribe to his full media. And I will see you in the next one. Thank you very much for watching. Gabriel here. Peace.